Welcome to this first in a series of videos covering my attempt to cross the Northwest Passage and back from Tectoyotuck to Pond Denley. The trip starts in Austin, Texas with a 4,200 mile drive to Tectoyotuck and then hopping in my 16 foot John boat and heading east. Here we go. Thanks for checking out Ageless Wanderer. We know you're going to like the channel, so please subscribe now. So where is Tuktoyatuk? Well, we know it's about 4,200 miles north of Austin, Texas, but it's also about 200 miles east of the Alaskan border. <clears throat> And it's also about 20 miles east of the mouth of the Mackenzie River. And it's situated directly on the Arctic Ocean. Let's talk about Tuktoyatuk a bit. Tuktoyatuk is a village of 1,000 Western Inuit. It means resembling elk if translated to English. It is an industrial town with a large harbor. Uh, stuff comes down the Mackenzie River for distribution in the Eastern Arctic, as well as around the top of Alaska. Well, I made it to Tuktoyatuk, to the top of the Arctic Highway, and to the edge of the Arctic Ocean. It was time to park my rig in front of the sign, take some photos, pull off my shoes, and walk over and dip my toes into the Arctic. Burr! It's cold. Being a small boat nerd, I did have to check out all the boats that were being uh, used in the area. So I walked around the harbor area and uh, along the uh, coastal area near the houses and took some pictures of the boats. Most of them were V-bottom lines. They're riveted hulls. Uh, most of the guys had added some kind of windbreak to, I think, to help them deal with the weather. Uh, the Lund is a, uh, a V-bottom, but being riveted, it's kind of a fragile boat. I did see one kind of unusual flat-bottom boat with built-in wheels, but that, I, that was the only one I saw all the way through the Arctic. After driving around Tuktoyotuk and kind of getting to know my way around town, I contacted some people I met on my drive up uh, who actually lived there in Tuktoyotuk. They were able to help me uh, find a place to camp that night uh, where I didn't have to pay. Uh, I also uh, got directions on where to get fuel. There's no fuel docks down at the coast. You have to kind of drive to the uh, uh, edge of town, uh, load up jerry cans. Or in, in my case, I still had the boat on the trailer. So I loaded up all my tanks uh, and uh, to prepare for an early launch the next morning. Well, despite having so much fun getting to Tuktoyotuk, uh, checking it out, it was really time to wind down my day and uh, go uh, head up to the Arctic sign, get a last picture uh, before I had to head off to my renegade campsite and try and get some sleep. It was 11 p.m. when this picture was taken. The morning of the first day of my trip into the Arctic Ocean in my 16-foot John boat had arrived. We first uh, launched the boat and uh, the uh, lady who had uh, made arrangements with me to leave my boat over at the uh, city impound yard gave me a ride. We dropped off my car and trailer and got back to the uh, boat in front of the northern store. Uh, I headed up to the northern store, picked up a few resupplies, uh, hopped in my boat, and non-ceremoniously, I headed off into the Arctic. Each day before I headed out, I set a course into my chart plotter. Typically, an optimistic location was selected. Uh, my first day, I chose a, a location of Cape Perry, which was about 300 miles from Tuktoyatuk. But just in case, I go ahead and spot locations that I could get to safe harbor should the weather change or just decided I can't get all the way to my optimistic goal. I'm glad I did because on my first day, due to uh, sea conditions, I was only make, able to make it about 150 miles to Cape Bathurst. It was a great harbor. It was shallow but safe. 
a great place to spend my first night. Okay, let me give you a little idea of what I do out here. Uh, it's like playing a little video game because I cannot see the shore. I'm pretty far out and the shore is uh, very, uh, you know, not very tall, so it's just hard to see. So what I do is I just try to stay on that red line and it takes me on to the uh, next destination that I have set. And uh, you can see all those islands and stuff over there to the right. It's really shallow over there. And uh, that's why I'm uh, just kind of staying out away from the shoreline just a little bit. Let me go ahead and get some speed up and see what it feels like out here in the Gulf. Or excuse me, <laughs> the Arctic Ocean. Had this little storm here uh, brew up. It kicked up some white caps for a little while, but uh, I've gotten around it. <clears throat> it looks like I'm going to leave it behind. And I've got about 20 more miles, and I'm going to go ahead and set up my camp. But uh, everything's uh, good in the boat. And, uh, stopped and had lunch and a couple of snacks along the way. And my chart plotter is just working awesome. But uh, I'm going to get on to camp. The bear fence is installed. Goes around the bow. Comes back over here. And comes back around the backside. The charger is right here. And uh, the ground is in the salt water. And the Positive is hooked to the fence. It's energized right now. I'm bear protected. After setting up my bear fence, setting up my tent, and preparing my dinner, I settled down for a nice evening rest. Since it was getting late, I wanted to go ahead and um, do my route for the next day. It was about midnight, and I knew I wouldn't be getting out till relatively late the next morning. I planned a, a relatively short day of 150 miles to Pierce Point. That would set me up well if I had good weather to go ahead and get on to uh, Kuklatuk or maybe take a straight trip over to Cambridge Bay. It soon hit me how alone I was in the middle of the Arctic Ocean, camping in a 16-foot boat thousands of miles from home. After waking up, Stowing all of my gear and heading back out in the Arctic Ocean, I soon found a field of icebergs across my path. There's probably no better time than this to talk about safety as I enter the Arctic Ocean and its icebergs and sea ice. Prior to the trip, I did lots of research, read lots of books, and ended up contacting the Arctic Marine Communications Center. <clears throat> They put me in touch with Nordreg and asked me to supply them some information about my boat and my experience. They responded with a letter stating that they didn't recommend I take my boat into the Arctic. Well, I told them that I was still going to be going and uh, any help they could give me, I sure would appreciate it. Well, after that, we exchanged many emails and I attached one of those emails that I received just prior to leaving. They were really, uh, the Arctic Marine Communication Group, as well as Nordreg, were a really nice group to communicate with. And they assigned an ice expert and a weather expert to my uh, expedition. Uh, my router, uh, Tom Ewens, my brother, and Jack Dunn, a good friend of mine, worked with those entities as well as using weather applications to feed information to me as I was crossing the Gulf. Uh, it's not a solo operation, even though I was in the boat alone. It's a coordination of many, including government and friends, helping me through this uh, arduous journey. In addition to doing your research and connecting with all the proper authorities, 
Uh, you should bring some experience before you go into a crazy thing like this trip through the Arctic in a small boat. In my case, I started uh, when I was like 12 years old in middle school working for the local uh, boat dealership as an outboard mechanic when I was growing up. I uh, During summers in high school, I worked offshore on a 65-foot crew boat uh, as a deckhand, but spent a lot of time running the boat. Uh, when I got off to college, I worked my way through college as an outboard mechanic. And then graduating from college, I uh, went to work for Glastron as a... Uh, uh, district sales manager for Texas and New Mexico. Uh, so I've had a career in, uh, in working with boats. Uh, my brother bought a 35-foot island packet, and I've spent thousands of miles doing blue water sailing across the oceans with him on that. Um, when I was able to retire at a relatively young age, I solo uh, paddled a canoe uh, 2,500 miles down the length of the Mississippi River. My brother ended up purchasing a Beneteau 473, which is a 47-foot cruising sailboat. We ended up doing a lot of racing with it, doing the Regatta de Amigos, Tenda Vera Cruz three times, and then sailing it over to the Bahamas and leaving it there to do some cruising uh, around that area. I guess just uh, several years ago, I set the John Boat World Record in a 2,244-mile uh, trip in the John Boat. So, this wasn't my first hurrah, and uh, so I did bring a lot of experience that helped me as I uh, dealt with the challenges of the Arctic. Well, I've just encountered my first large sheet of sea ice. I uh, am going to give a try uh, getting around it to the south, but it's kind of foggy right now, so I can't see very far. But um, hopefully it's not too big because I've been making really good time today. It's very calm. As I traveled through the calmer sections of the Arctic Ocean, close to coastal areas, I'd often see what looked like steam rising out of the water. In actuality, it was beluga whales spouting as their pod traveled along the coast. After driving my boat south a little ways and north a little ways, I decided uh, I better conserve fuel and just go ahead and stop my boat. So I pulled up the port side of my boat to the sea ice and killed my motor. And I was sitting there uh, texting a message to Jack Dunn, uh, one of my routers, asking for uh, some routing either through the ice field or around the ice field. And all of a sudden, it was like the ocean parted to the right side of my boat. And there was this huge, dark blue suburban just coming out of the water. I finally realized this is a whale. The whale's nose rose about 10 feet in the air. And I could see a little eyeball about the size of a softball 10 feet below its nose just looking at me. It just stared there still looking at me for probably 10 to 15 seconds. Man, my breathing was deep. My heart was pounding. It was so crazy exciting. I felt I needed to pinch myself. It just slid down slowly in the water and peacefully swam away. It was the most amazing encounter. The Arctic is a very special place to be. Right now I'm stuck in a big sheet of uh, sea ice and I'm trying to work my way out. Uh, since the wind's been from the northeast, I'm trying to head northeast, kind of guessing the uh, ice sheet has formed up to the uh, south. So I'm getting ready to run over a little ice here. seem to do it just fine that uh, advanced breakaway is working really good but uh, yeah it's uh, got little rainbows all over the place here and just uh, looking for holes to work my way north and get around this and uh, get back on course day one had used more fuel than I expected due to sea conditions and sea ice I had to work my way through so the plan was to go ahead and uh, stop off at Kuklatuk and uh, refuel there before I head off to uh, Cambridge Bay. 
Unfortunately, due to the sea conditions on day two, I was only make, able to make it to Pierce Point. When I made it to Pierce Point, there was a natural bridge formation. And if you knew me, there was not a chance I wasn't going to go through it. The safe harbor and protective cove I was headed toward at Pierce Point was just east of the point and was previously a dew line location. What is a dew line? It's a distant early warning site used during the Cold War to detect any incoming missiles that might be coming toward Canada or the United States. After rounding Pierce Point, I entered the protective cove, which was the home of the dew line location. Uh, the signature point when you enter this uh, protective cove is this huge rock right in the middle that has an opening through its uh, bottom. And uh, I didn't go through it this trip, but I talked to some snowmobilers uh, from the area that when the ocean freezes over, they do go under that rock. Uh, proceeded over to the little uh, camp house that was uh, in the cove, and uh, I got out and walked around, and there was an old boat there. It was really cool. It was an air-cooled mid-engine boat, and um, there were a lot of tools and other things kind of spread around the, the, the old building. I entered the building, and it had been damaged pretty badly. You could tell it was likely bears uh, that had gotten in there and torn it up. Uh, there was some pictures of hunters and uh, a sign of the company that used to uh, run a hunting outfit that operated out of the building. Um, kind of surprisingly, when I got into Polituck, I ran into one of the guys that ran the hunting company. I'm going to go ahead and wrap this video at this point. Uh, I'm going to try to keep the videos in the 15 to 20 minute range uh, so they're you know easily watchable and something you want to come back and look at in a week or so. Uh, so um, I stopped that evening and we reviewed the weather and it was not looking good for the next couple of days to uh, leave Pierce Point and head toward Kuklatuk. So I made the decision to head back to uh, Polituck, which was about 60 miles south and behind me and uh, you know, meet the people of Polituck, top off the tanks and get ready for a, another attempt at heading further east.